so the second talk of the day will be by uh, Sergei Gukov. Uh, this will be the first talk of his uh, mini course, and it's titled VOA of a four manifold M4. Okay, so the goal of, uh, so this is again the title, VOA of M4. I hope, actually, a funny story. Uh, recently, I gave a talk on this subject at a different conference and uh, I sent my title and uh, an email, I said it like this VOA of M4. And uh, then when I come to the conference, I see uh, VOA of M24. And then, of course, I realized that M24 has already a very well-established career in uh, vertex algebras. So, but anyway, it's not VOA M24, it's VOA of M4. Um, and the goal of the lectures will be to explain very rich connection between uh, strongly coupled dynamics dynamics of quantum field theories, I could say low-dimensional quantum field theory, uh, because we're, we'll be talking about two dimensions and three dimensions. So on the one hand, so that's, if you wish, your modern Langlands correspondence. This is one side of the correspondence. And uh, topology, and again, I could say low-dimensional topology, um, of three manifolds and four manifolds, that's partly where M4 uh, comes into the story. And uh, my goal is actually, or toll is uh, quite high in the sense that uh, on the one hand, like I promised yesterday, I will be extremely pedagogical, so I'll try. But I'll also try to aim for something highly non-trivial. I'm not going to settle on easy things. So, for instance, uh, here in topology, the goal will be really to introduce new invariants, new topological invariants. And in the world of three manifolds, this is already uh, quite non trivial. And in the world of four manifolds, that's even cooler because we don't know how to classify smooth structures on four manifolds. So, and I'll explain uh, where there are limitations. So, it's highly non trivial. So, here, the goal will be to actually learn not just about topology, but also about quantum field theory. So I'll try to explain to you some phenomena in quantum field theory, how to deal with it. So physicists will learn, hopefully, something new about QFTs. So here, the goal will be to introduce uh, some new partition functions, for example, new indices, um, and uh, see new examples of dualities In, in those theories. Uh, and the emphasis in all of these cases is on the word new. So there are many papers, good and bad, which, for example, take very well-known duality, such as cyborg duality, and apply various index calculations to, to those dualities. That's not going to be the aim. We'll aim much higher. We'll aim to produce completely new dualities, in fact, using topology. So I'll try to explain how something in mathematics can actually lead to really new physics. And by new, I mean something that has not been seen before. So you, it was like you Columbus, you make a step in completely unknown territory. And it's not going to be applying old techniques to well-known dualities. <laughs> so <clears throat> what I'll be talking about is based on several papers, um, one of which is uh, sequence of work with Abhijit, Gade and uh, Pavel Putrov. So that's from 2013. And, uh, well, since Abhijit is here, even when I'm gone after this course, you can uh, approach him for many suggestions, problems, or clarifications. So he's responsible for all the gaps in what I'm going to say. If I'm hit by a bus tomorrow, he's responsible for <laughs> continuing my course. So uh, this is one uh, reference, or a couple of references, and another is uh, work with that same guy. 
and another guy. So this is 2016, and also a similar group of people that involves uh, Dupe uh, from 2017. So these are main references. I'll give them once and for all, and uh, sometimes won't uh, give credit to my collaborators, <laughs> some of whom are in the audience, uh, but uh, there may be additional references that I'll mention as, as we go. Now, uh, again, how do I achieve this kind of goal to be pedagogical and completely elementary on one side and uh, explain something where I claim to have the emphasis on new and highly non-trivial things? Uh, well, I had my plan and I sent it to Ashwin. And when he saw my original version of the abstract, he said, Sergey, uh, you cannot do this. Uh, uh, this is, uh, you have to introduce this, you have to introduce that. So basically, he tied my hands all behind my back, saying that I pretty much have to start with calculus, you know? And then I spent some time and thinking and so on and decided that I have to modify my lectures. And before I get to VOA of M4, whatever it stands for, I have to start with calculus. And this first lecture, at least the first one, I hope it will continue like that later in the second lecture and so on, will be understandable uh, to both physicists and mathematicians as long as you have good understanding of basic calculus. So I promise I'm not exaggerating. This first lecture is going to be super elementary, but by the end of it, you learn something new. So that's, that's my goal. Huh? Uh, you, you steal my thunder, so yes. Uh, the, the, that, that will come later. Where is the eraser? Uh, let's see, Tony was using it. Uh, well, I see this eraser. No, but there was something else, I think. Anyway, it, it will work, it's fine. Um, yeah, so... I think I already told some of you before that uh, I was uh, at Amasarai during the spring semester, and my old friend Sheldon Cutts told me a story that when Brian Greene, famous writer, and he used to be a physicist too, um, he, when he was still a physicist back in the 90s, he had to give a colloquium to mathematicians, and he tried to translate physics into math, so he started his colloquium writing on a blackboard definition. A conformal field theory is a table of integrals. So when I heard the story, it took me a moment to process what exactly he meant, because even though I understand now what he meant, I'm not sure I fully subscribe to it. It's one of these instances where taking something well-defined in physics and trying to translate it to math leads to, well, <laughs> I'll let you fill the blanks. Um, but in my talk, actually, it will be quite relevant. So I will give you a table of integrals, and uh, in fact, I'll give you a table of uh, three types of integrals. And all of these integrals will have the following structure. So what we're going to do today uh, is to learn to integrate. That's pretty much at the level of calculus. And we'll assign these integrals to the following data. We'll have a graph whose vertices are labeled by integer numbers. Okay. So like I say, this is not going to be super sophisticated. There'll be nothing like uh, what I had in the talk yesterday. So, no, not at all. So in fact, sorry for, that's accidentally, and, and let's make it, you know, let's take uh, 100 vertices or 100 million vertices. So that's, that's how generic you can be. So uh, you have these labels, A1, A2, a3, A4, and up to 100 million. Okay. So all these AIs are supposed to be integers, and that's going to be initial data. So given such input data, graph with vertices labeled by integer numbers, we're supposed to associate to it something. And we'll have three tables of integrals. 
uh, which have the following structure, will integrate over a bunch of variables. In fact, one complex variable per vertex. So there will be a product over vertices. And if I denote this variable, say, by x, there will be a dxi to pi i xi type of integral. <clears throat> then product over some universal function, which I'll associate to every vertex. So I have to give you a rule what piece of integral we associate to a vertex. And there will be analogous product over edges. And I have to tell you what factor uh, we associate to, an, to every edge. Okay, and I'll repeat this three times in the first lecture. Uh, they'll do a lot of repetition of integration, and we'll learn something in the process each time, making it a little bit more interesting. Okay. So it's going to be the structure, um, and now I guess I can proceed to table of integrals number one. So I have to each time I have to give you three pieces of data, what integrand you associate to a vertex, what integrand you associate to an edge, and what's the contour of integration to make sure it's well defined. And hopefully there'll be no question that this is extremely well defined problem. Something you can easily explain to undergraduate. So I hope uh, now you uh, see that I fulfill my promise and start very low. Uh, okay, so table number one. If you have a vertex, um, labeled by integer a, so that you're going to associate twice sinh of pi u squared exponential of pi i a u squared over 2. So here my integration variable is going to be called u. So there will be u1, u2, and so on. Instead of x, I just, for to confuse you if you wish, uh, use different variables. We'll be integrating over u's in a way that I'll say in a second how. Huh? Uh, so all, always we should think of them as complex variables. So, um, but again, I'll, I'll tell you the integration contour in a second. In this first table, uh, you can actually think of them as real. So the contour, I'll tell you ahead of time, will be integrating over real values of u from minus infinity to plus infinity. I'm going to put it on the board in a second. So the next factor is uh, what you associate to an edge. An edge connects two vertices. So you pick two vertices in a graph. Uh, each one has some integration variable, say x1, x2, or u1, u2 uh, for, for, for the vertices. And therefore, in principle, this edge factor may depend on two variables, u1, u2, or ui, uj. And here it's going to be sine of pi u1, u2, divided by square root of a i times sinh of pi u1 times sinh pi u2. Okay. And uh, like I already mentioned in the answer to Tanya's question, uh, we are supposed to integrate over u from minus infinity to plus infinity, or uh, if you know a little bit more than basic calculus and prefer to think about complex analysis and complex plane and so on, then it's actually going to be slightly more convenient to tilt the contour a little bit, integrate over u by taking the real axis and then tilting it with small angle epsilon. So that's if you want to think. If you don't want to think, you can just take this rule, feed it into Mathematica, and see what it spits out. So that's your homework, to actually think a little bit about it, play with it, convince yourself that uh, everything is reasonably convergent, so for this, you may want to assume uh, that this graph is, say, either positive definite or negative definite in the following sense. It will be convenient for us to introduce the notion of adjacency metrics. Adjacency. Yeah. 
Just DU, just DU. No two pi i's, yes. So uh, th th this is general structure. Uh, forget this. So, yeah. So forget this. Uh, it's in it, it, it has the same. Every time each table will have same rough form. So we'll be integrating over one integration variable per vertex with some prescription of how to do the integral. Uh, so that's why this is kind of schematic. There will be universal factor for each vertex and the universal factor for each edge. So here is universal factor for each vertex, which depends on A, the integer label, universal factor for each edge, and the prescription is that we integrate over U's on a real axis for all of them. So this contour, in some sense, is not much of a contour, it's just real axis integral. So that's a schematic formula. Yeah, edge factors, at least in this case, do not depend on the labels A, I, A, J, correct, yes. Yeah. So uh, to simplify things a little bit, which is not terribly crucial, but is, is uh, useful here, let's introduce a JSON matrix, I'll call it Q, such that its IJ element will be the following. It will be a matrix of the size uh, 100 by 100, if we have 100 vertices, or 100 million by 100 million, if we have 100 million vertices. And the IJ entry will be equal to 1 if IJ connected by the edge so it basically encodes connectivity of, of this graph. Now, this of course makes sense if i and j are not identical. If, if i and j happen to be equal, then it's a little confusing. But that's exactly the case when we already have some data uh, assigned to, an edge, so to a vertex. So in fact, if i happens to be equal to j, we just take the value ai and put it on a diagonal of this matrix, and we declare that it's zero otherwise. So this is basic combinatorics of graphs. Uh, not yet. No, 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 we don't. We don't. One can, but uh, yes, in general, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yes, that's correct. So here we go. Uh, this is what's called adjacency matrix of a graph. I guess if you learn anything from graph theory, this is probably one of the first things you learn. Uh, and when this matrix happens to be positive or negative definite, uh, we'll say that it's uh, definite input data. So it's actually convenient to assume that it's definite if you really want to program this in Mathematica, which I strongly encourage you to do, because next I'm going to give you homework. And homework is that since everything is super concrete, again, please ask me questions if uh, something looks confusing, uh, we're supposed to produce uh, a value of this integral for every simple graph. For example, I can take as my starting example a graph with uh, two vertices, one edge, and put labels, say, 4 and 2. So I'm going to call this integrals z, and I'll ask you to compute this z for, for this graph. It should be a number, right? I made everything super explicit. Uh, the variables u, u1, u2, we already integrate over, so it should be just a number. So the question is, uh, let's compute it. So um, I'll give you a couple of more examples. Say, uh, let's have a graph with two edges and three vertices. Let's label them 1, 5, and 2. And let's... Um, have yet another example and have some different set of labels. And again, in each case, we're supposed to produce a number uh, from, from very concrete computation. Okay? Yeah. No, that's exactly the question Jack was asking. Uh, I said no. But you're allowed to have loops, but let's, let's not have multiple edges. Essentially, no. Uh, if you want, you can. Um, we'll come back to this question later. It's easy to incorporate this. I'll, I'll, in fact, it will appear naturally. In fact, it's already in these rules. It's not obvious yet. I'll, I'll, I'll show you later how it's already in, incorporated here. 
Okay, any other questions? So we have table of integrals. It's extremely well defined. And um, again, I'm at the level of calculus. We're going to learn something highly non-trivial in a second. So it's important that uh, you agree that everything is, makes sense to you. Okay. So actually, this table of integrals is really nice. Uh, when I've given this talks before, um, I saw people actually give me the answer to the homework problem before I finish table two, to which I'll turn right now. So it's fairly concrete, you can program it, and we'll do some experiments a bit later. In fact, in table two, I'm going to use this adjacency matrix, which we just introduced. Table of integrals number two. And like I mentioned before, each time we're going to move from table one to table two and then from table two to table three, we'll introduce one new ingredient which makes life a little bit more interesting. That makes the story a little bit richer. And uh, now I'm going to return to my original variables that I call xi, and we'll have a contour integral in table two, but uh, for balance, I'm going to write it in a slightly different form. So in table two, this integral that we're going to associate to every such input data, a graph which looks like a quiver with a bunch of vertices and edges, uh, will be integral just, about ver uh, just over vertices. So here, i is going to leave in a set of vertices. Uh, it will be exactly of the form, as I mentioned in the beginning, dxi over 2 pi i xi. <clears throat> and here, I'm going to... There are several ways to write this integral. Uh, one is uh, exactly in the form I advertised before, where you have product over vertices and then product over edges. I'm going to take advantage of this matrix, adjacency matrix that we introduced a moment ago, and massage it in a form that's, that looks like product over vertices, but in fact, it's using adjacency matrix, which actually contains information about connectivity. So it's just a different way of rewriting the uh, same expression. And I do it essentially for balance. So here, we'll have one minus product over j, uh, xj to matrix element qij. So that's where adjacency matrix appears to a negative power. Then times, one minus um, xi to the degree or valency of the vertex i. Uh, so this degree is number of edges that go into that vertex, minus two. And then times xi to the power bi. Okay. Sorry? What connect? Is the graph always connected? Not necessarily. It doesn't have to be. But if, as you see, if it's disconnected, what's going to happen is that it simply factorizes into a product of integrals. That's a very good question. Uh, you spotted a new element uh, that appeared on table two. So previously we had a graph such that each edge carried part of the input data, namely this uh, AIs, which were integers, and so on. Uh, each vertex also carried integration variable, but we get rid of it, so the answer, of course, does not depend on it, so that's the point, we do the integral. But now, uh, this seems to suggest that I also assign Bs into, uh, to every uh, vertex as well. And let's take them also to be integer because see, what's written here is actually a rational function. So this integral is essentially taking rational function of our integration variables x, i, x, j, and uh, integrating them, in fact, integrating on unit circle for each integration variable. So I specify that data as well. 
<laughs> and for it to be a rational function, in other words, for it to be well defined, it's convenient to think of b's as integers. Otherwise, we have branch cut, and that's clearly inconvenient, even if we have no other input data to, to fix b's. So a priori, now this integral depends on a graph which encodes ai's, but it also actually depends on the choice of b. So that's a new input data. Okay. Any other questions? Is it clear? By the way, another question I often get uh, when giving this lecture is, is that I probably made a mistake. I, I made a typo. That here, here you see sine function, trigonometric function, and here you have hyperbolic trigonometric function. And in fact, uh, early on, uh, I got confused. I checked my notes and then went to the paper because I thought I made a typo, but it's actually not. So this integrand looks horrible, to be honest. I mean, once you, see, once you look at this type of integrals, you see that there is no nice structure. You have sine, cinches, you have some crazy square root of a, tai. Uh, where the hell it comes from? I mean, it, it, how does one dream of such integral? Um, unless we really want to do homework at the calculus type class, what's the purpose? So that's, that's an obvious question we should have in the back of our mind. This integral is slightly better. It's integral of a rational function, but still looks uh, fairly contrived. And uh, unless you really compute the answer, for all you know, this integral may be equal to zero for all of the graphs that we're computing. So it's, uh, it, it can be something either extremely trivial or extremely uninteresting. <clears throat> in fact, uh, if you think about this type of integral in table two and ask how does it depend on value of this bi, you discover that uh, it's actually sensitive to value of the bi, uh, not so much. Because here it looks like I immediately improved my input data by putting zillions of integers on every vertex. So you have lots of choices for every given vertex. And if you had 100 vertices, you had 100 new integers to put in. But what really happens is that you can shift um, this values of bi, which take values originally in the lattice, z to number of vertices of the graph, by q, uh, by rows of matrix q uh, times uh, z to the number of vertices. Or more precisely, so uh, you should think of this as uh, z to number of vertices as a lattice, because we actually have nice bilinear form given by the adjacency matrix Q. And what we're essentially doing is we're taking a quotient of that lattice by its dual. So what you get is a set which is called co-kernel of Q. And as long as determinant of Q is non-zero, there are actually finitely many elements in this co-kernel. So let's assume that determinant of Q is non-zero. So an absolute value of the determinant tells us the cardinality of this set. And interesting thing about this integral in table two is not only that now it depends on additional data that I introduced, but that it has equivalences or invariances that allow you to shift B by uh, rows of the matrix Q. Okay. <clears throat> so it actually does not depend, even if your graph has 100 vertices, but determinant of Q is equal to 1, you can choose any value of B you want, and you're going to get the same answer. So that's already quite interesting. So it's already first type of equivalences that we're going to see in the story appear in various different forms. In fact, now you have done the homework number one, then you see that all of these symbols are actually equal. And the precise value is non-zero. It's something like, I don't know, 0 0.8, blah, blah, blah. It's probably, may even be a complex number for what I know. I don't remember. But the point is, whatever this number is, they're actually equal. So that's another type of equivalence. <clears throat> we thought that we started doing integrals and producing output for each graph whose vertices are decorated by integers. 
In table two, we even introduced additional decorations. But now we see that there are equivalences that relate, first of all, different types of graphs, and secondly, different types of decorations. So in the case of decorations, the non-trivial part is really labeled by a finite set, this called kernel of Q, and as far as graphs go, um, we don't know what the rules are yet, but uh, we know that some of them happen to be equal. And that's, that's the first important lesson that we want to learn by, by doing calculus. Any, any question? Is this clear? Okay. So then, na natural next question is, uh, what are their precise equivalences? So given this input data of a graph whose uh, vertices are labeled by integers, the question is, uh, what are the relations that we're allowed to do on a graph that don't change the answer. So, um, for example, do this graphs with particular labels happen to produce the same answer as many other graphs? And if so, what are they? How do we find them? So this brings a natural question of trying to really list all these rules that, um, that, that produce equivalent results. So I'm done with the table two, I guess. Uh, well, maybe I'll raise table one. And the rules are the following. Since all of these integrals are easy to program, you can actually just experiment with them, and uh, we'll do some experiments when table three comes along. And uh, you quickly find that if you have a graph who's, uh, with the following configuration, so here uh, you have a vertex labeled by A plus minus one, and here you have a vertex labeled by the plus one or minus one, both choices are okay as long as upper sign is correlated with upper sign and lower sign is correlated with lower sign. You can replace this, so this is equivalent, to a local configuration of a graph where you completely remove this uh, extra vertex and extra edge and change the value of label in such a way that it becomes simply A. Okay. In fact, you can see that uh, my first two examples in the homework are related precisely by this kind of move, where I can go from here to here uh, and change, remove one edge, which connects one and five, and change the label such it becomes one less, namely four in this example. So it's precisely a manifestation of this phenomenon, which is completely general, and you can play with this and see that it holds on any other graph. Exactly. So uh, here, uh, this poorly visible dot, dot, dot means that there could be lots of stuff here which is not going to change, so it's exactly the same dot, dot, dot. So it's a local move. You don't change the rest of the graph. But yes, this, this guy is the only one which, uh, which is connected to, to, to this vertex, yes. It's an example of a local move. You could say that it's a little bit special because Look, we managed to identify some vertex which is labeled by plus one and minus one and doesn't talk to anybody else except for its only friend. Well, there aren't so many of us here in the room who have only one friend. Typical graph, connectivity graph, has many edges, many friends, and situation should probably be more like this. For any two friends, they may talk to each other, labeled by A1, A2, but they also talk to lots of other people. So that's a more typical situation. Actually, this one is also involved in equivalence relation. If you find two such friends which have labels A1, A2, you can do something analogous where you introduce additional edge and additional vertex. These two friends still talk to the rest of the crowd, the rest of the world that hasn't changed, but now they have a new friend 
someone between them uh, with label plus minus one, just like in the previous move, and this changes to A1 plus minus one and A2 plus minus one, respectively. So that's another equivalence relation. And we're about to learn the second lesson from doing this calculus type exercise. Namely, that both table one and table two enjoy exactly the same set of equivalence relations. See, the integrals in table one were trigonometric type integrals. Integrals in table two were some rational functions. And admittedly, in both cases, the data was attached to same type of graph with integer labels, but they look completely different. So why on earth they enjoy exactly the same set of equivalence relations, namely these two local moves and a couple of more that I'm not going to list, but you can easily find in the paper. So that's actually an important question. Why? Why two completely different tables of integrals reflect the same set of symmetries? Moreover, lesson number three that we're going to learn from this now is that if you open a textbook on topology, you recognize exactly these pictures. So topologists call these diagrams Kirby diagrams, and what we just learned is the set of Kirby moves, or Kirby calculus, rather, by, by doing the usual calculus, or type of calculus. When I gave this talk in the audience of Mike Friedman, he said that uh, this is the quickest way he knows how to learn Kirby calculus, because usually to get to this set of moves in a topology class would probably take many, many lectures, but here you can actually easily teach it to undergrad. So you just ask, let's do some integrals, and let's ask, what are the symmetries of these integrals? Symmetries that allow to do local operations or local moves on a graph that don't change the answer. So the claim is going to be that there will be exactly five moves. I listed two of them, and that's it, nothing else. Integrals are complicated enough that they don't enjoy any accidental moves beyond what you may see in Kirby Calculus textbook. So then, the question is not only why table one and table two exhibit exactly the same set of symmetries, but why the symmetries or equivalences on a graph are exactly the same as you find in a topology textbook. You start with exactly the same data. of a graph uh, labeled by integers, A1, A2, A3, A4, and so on. And to this initial data, you can associate uh, three different types of manifolds. So first, to each such graph, you can associate a non-compact four-manifold. that I'm going to call M4, such that uh, each vertex of the graph is a two-cycle in a four-manifold. No, 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 Gra graph does not have to be a tree. Uh, this was already asked before. So to each vertex of the graph, you associate a two-cycle. And each time, the, there is an edge between vertices, uh, two cycles intersect each other. And moreover, in four manifold topology, uh, since we're in dimension four, two cycles may have self intersections. They're exactly mid dimensional, so you can actually count how many times this guy intersects itself. So the number AI that we attach to a vertex is precisely the record of that information. So here in this construction, uh, each such graph represents a four-manifold with a bunch of two cycles that intersect according to this tree. Sorry, it doesn't have to be a tree. Huh? 
No, I specifically say cycles because in simple examples there are spheres, but they don't have to be. And we'll run into examples very quickly where, where they're not spheres. So that's why I say cycles. And essentially this adjacency matrix Q is intersection form on mid-dimensional cohomology of that form. Now, here I say non-compact. So therefore, you can essentially, with no extra work, also say that to every such graph, you can associate a closed three-manifold. Closed three-manifold by simply taking the boundary of that non-compact four-manifold. And I'm going to call the three-manifold M3. Yes, Jacques. It is, it is, it is. I'll, I'll come back to it in, in a little bit, yeah. So, but still it gives uh, 15 million examples, if you wish. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's rather special. That's a, that's a very good point. Um, no, I'm actually not reviewing uh, construction of this four manifold. I can't do it in a discussion session because that will take me a little bit astray, since, again, I want to get, in fact, more general than, than this. So what I'm describing here is a property. So there is a construction that you find in topology textbooks on Kirby calculus. I didn't get the chance to check if uh, here the library has a very standard textbook by Gomf and Stipschitz. But my point is that if you had this book, which I encourage you to have, you'd see exactly the same picture. So I'm trying to say a couple of words about what these pictures represent in that textbook. They basically mean that there is a construction given such a graph of a non-compact form manifold, and it has a property that uh, for each vertex it has two cycle, non-trivial two cycle and H2, and intersection is essentially encoded by the graph. So that's, that's all I'm saying. It's a property, it's not a construction. But then, actually more relevant to us is not so much the four manifold, but the other two items. So one is a closed three manifold, which is simply a boundary of item number one. And then there is also item number three, which is uh, a closed four manifold. In fact, there is a canonical way to compactify this type of graphs into uh, closed four manifold, and sometimes when you speak to a topologist, uh, depending on who you speak, she probably may have in mind for each such graph one of the three items, either closed four manifold, closed three manifold, or non-compact four manifold with boundary. So I just want to warn you that if you read topology papers or uh, talk to, to a topologist, she may have one of these immediately in her head depending on whether she works more with one, two, or three. So here in item one, topologists construct non-compact four manifold with boundary. And um, item number two, it simply takes a boundary. So it actually forgets a lot of useful information. So if you have some non-compact four manifold, which looks like this, it has a boundary M3, we just take M3. So it actually forgets a lot of useful stuff. Uh, M4, M4, M4. So there are cycles of this guy, and then I'm saying that from item number one, from this construction, there are several, two, two other constructions to get either closed three manifold by taking the boundary, or taking, uh, constructing compact manifold by capping it off. There is a way to basically put a lead on this non-compact thing. Uh, well, three manifold this M3 is boundary of the whole thing. In this case, yes, but uh, more uh, in the case when we deal with graphs, yes, more generally not. Uh, and, and I do want to aim to be, of course, a, a lot more general than this. This is just self-contained arena that's uh, rich enough so that we can play and simple enough that, that um, we avoid delicate things. So regarding uh, how general it is, <coughs> generalization, so what I just described for you, this construction of three manifolds and four manifolds out of graphs, again, I'm not going to explain unless uh, you really request in the discussion section, 
Um, in the case of three manifolds, it's actually close enough to give you general uh, three manifold if you generalize it, including a couple of more steps. And I'll probably say a few words about it. So in the case of three manifolds, there is a very simple, relatively simple systematic generalization of what I'm telling you, which can build a general three manifold out of it. It basically will involve decorating each of these vertices with one more integer, if you wish, or some additional data. In the case of four manifolds, no. It's actually still very far. In the big, wild world of four manifolds, it's still pretty tiny. So then topologists usually have the following mindset. When they try to build something, such as a three manifold or four manifold, they have to have two things in mind. First, they have to have construction that allows you, given some combinatorial data, to produce a topological space. So that's precisely what these uh, ROs do in, in, in their world. Uh, but then, sometimes, there are several different ways to construct the same topological space. And they have to ask the following question. Among my construction, which constructions or which input data are actually related? So what are the equivalences? In fact, Piotr talked about this in his talk when he talked about knots. He said that knots are represented by planar graphs on a plane, and sometimes they produce exactly the same topological knot if they're related by Reidemeister moves that he mentioned and described to us. So in the world of three manifolds and four manifolds, there are analogous constructions, and analog of Reidemeister moves are the so-called Kirby moves that we see here. Now, Kirby moves are such that they change the initial input data, but do not change the output. And as you can imagine, they are slightly different in the case of first item here or second item, because it's a much stronger condition to not change the entire four manifold rather than just to preserve its boundary. So as a result, you have two types of Kirby moves, the ones which preserve M3 only, or the ones which preserve both interior and M3. So what we see here, to be more precise, is actually 3D Kirby calculus. It's, it's, it's a set of moves which actually changes four manifold. In fact, you can now see why it would change because we create additional vertices. So we create completely new two cycles in homology. In a world of four manifold, that would never be allowed, but it actually does not change the boundary. Is this clear? Any questions? So therefore, what we just constructed in table one and table two are two invariants of three manifolds. Why? Because Piotr explained it. In order to construct an invariant of something topological, you have to, first of all, have a construction, and B, invariants with respect to invariances or equivalences, which don't change topological space. So in his talk, it was important that John's polynomial, A polynomial, and other things or invariant under skein relations, or under the Meister moves. So here, in table one and table two, actually by construction, we saw examples of numbers attached to graph that we now know, at least in the world of three manifolds, means a closed three manifold. And what we see, and that's actually not hard to prove, that this table one and table two produce you outputs which are invariants under corresponding equivalences that you see in topology. So therefore, we actually constructed the definition topological invariance of three manifolds. Oh, that's a very good question. Thank you. And that's actually important to uh, what I'm going to next. So you can ask in this construction, so let's focus on this now. We'll come back to four manifolds in later lectures. But in the world of three manifolds, that to be relevant to us because it's only invariant under 3D Kirby moves, you can ask indeed, what is the vector B that lives in core kernel of this matrix Q? So now you can be in your mindset and actually start asking questions, how does this combinatorial data translate into topology? This has beautiful answer. It's nothing but H1 of M3 uh, with integer coefficients. So this core kernel, if uh, say determinant Q is non-zero, is a finite group and that's it. It's H1. Huh? 
Well, if determinant is non-zero, that's, that's all there is. So, but in general, I'll, I'll get there to the torsion point. Yeah, so now that, that we know that we constructed two topological invariants of three manifolds in table one and table two, it's natural to ask, what is table one and what is table two? Tony, you have it. No, no, I'm saying that, um, actually, I maybe, I, I, wait, let me make a slightly more careful statement. I'm saying if determinant is non-zero and the graph is always a tree, for instance, so let me make that assumption, then indeed B1 is going to be zero. So in fact, uh, so thank you, that's another good question. Now I can say, what, what does it mean to have a loop in a graph? It actually means to have a loop in a three manifold as well. Same, you can achieve the determinant of Q being zero. So you can, if you relax the condition that it's non-zero that we had, that it's bigger or less than zero, then um, you can also have non-trivial B1. And now I can actually, thank you for asking the question, come back to the question that Jacques was asking about the loop or edge that connects the vertex to itself. Now you can see that by doing some sequence of these moves, what you can take, you can take a loop that starts, originates, and ends on the same vertex, and make certain moves which make it into um, edges connecting different vertices. So that's, that's, so therefore, in fact, the spoops, even though I didn't show them explicitly, are already incorporated in this game. But not multiple edges. Any, any other questions? Uh, no, it, it's additional data. That's a great question. It's, it's additional data. So therefore, that's a very good question. Table 1 produces a topological invariant of a 3-manifold with no extra data. It was just attached to a uh, graph with integer labels, and now we know that that determines a closed 3-manifold. But, um, but Table 2 had additional data if determinant of Q is equal to 1, this additional data didn't play any role, somehow it was vacuous, but if non-trivial, then, then we also attach invariants to 3-manifold and element of H1. So that's actually how we should interpret table 2 at this point. Okay. And question is, uh, what are these two invariants in table one and table two? If we're talking about topological invariants of three manifolds, we should be able to identify them. Maybe we know them by a different name. So let's try to guess. Uh, well, with an exception of experts such as Piotr Du and others, so those who are not working on this field, please try to guess what table one should be. It is some invariant of a three manifold, just brainstorm, throw out in there some invariants of three manifolds that you've heard about. Well, zero is a good invariant of three manifold, but we know that it's not, we're not in that category. Don't be shy. Any guess? Well, the characteristic for closed three manifold, it's unfortunately zero. So that's that, that's again already excluded. But thank you, that's a start. So, yeah. huh? Very good. So in fact, indeed, table one is uh, chern simons quantum chern simons partition function, but for uh, non-compact group SL2C. So it's it's a number, and it's. Uh, we immediately got in a world of highly non-trivial invariants, as you can see. It's, it's, um, with and Rishi Tichin drive invariants are analogous to Simon's partition functions for SU2, SU3, and so on. And um, SL2C version for not compact gauge group, in fact, complex, is fairly recent uh, subject of work related to Hitchin space and other topics. And Table one computes precisely that kind of Chern Simons path integral. So this is a quantum invariant, quantum group invariant associated to SL2C. Okay, table two is actually trickier. So thank you for solving the case for table one. Table two is tricky because it's not just invariant of a three manifold, it's invariant of a three manifold with additional choice of structure, element of H1. 
at least when it's uh, when this part is its final group. So what could it be? Let's let's brainstorm again. Huh? Ed Wilson lines. Uh, that's actually a very good guess, but that's not what it is. I'll give you a hint. In table two, if we do calculations, we often compute the answer, and often it turns out to be integer. So in table one, that was not the case. That number is some fractional random number. I mean, not fractional in the sense it could be transcendental. But in table two, it's actually integer most of the time. Not always, but most of the time. So it feels like it's counting something. There were two suggestions. Uh, can you repeat both? Crossing number of the loop. Uh, close enough, actually, that's good. There was another suggestion. Huh? Instant on number? Uh, not quite, but in fact, both of these answers are uh, equally warm to, to, to the correct answer. They're approaching it from two different sides. Anybody else, maybe? Any guess? What are the big names, you know, in low-dimensional topology? Just let's brainstorm on names. Uh, th th this, these things have names. Okay, so the fathers of the subject are actually, so since it's supposed to be elementary course, I promise to state the level of calculus. As you see, we're learning Kirby calculus from calculus. And Kirby, yes, is a big name in this subject, but he came relatively late compared to, say, Alexander or Kasson. So Piotr, in his talks, uh, talked about Alexander polynomial, and table two is actually analog of Alexander polynomial for three manifolds. In fact, if you have a three-manifold given by surgery, you can compute this number in table two from Alexander polynomial that, that Piotr mentioned in his talks. Uh, it has other names. It's uh, Turaev torsion uh, of a three-manifold or equivalently cyberquitan invariant of a three-manifold, where you take... Um, so cyberquitan equations are usually defined in dimension four, but you can take a four-manifold, which is a circle across a three-manifold, and still do the counting of solutions to cyberquitan PDEs, which is more or less the only case where you can actually do the counting of solutions to PDEs. And the number in table two is that number. Uh, if you know cyberquitan theory, you know that the result is supposed to be labeled by choice of spin C structure, and this is precisely your choice of spin C structure. So. Not only what we learned today is, is how Kirby calculus look like and how we can derive them from usual calculus, we learn how to compute fairly sophisticated invariants of three manifolds. Uh, not from the big picture, but rather in a very pedestrian, concrete way, if you want to do computations, if you want to compute, say, cyberquitan invariant of a Poincaré sphere, now you have the tools to do that. Uh, yes. So... Uh, Everything I say today is for rank one. And the reason is that we attach one integration variable per vertex. If you were to do rank n, there would be n integrations per vertex to do. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to it. Yeah. In fact, I don't know how to do this integrals in high rank. So that would be one open problem I want to pose. OK, so I promised um, table number three. And uh, I also promised that each table will introduce one new ingredient. So let's go to, to table three and uh, introduce one more ingredient. So, in the beginning of this lecture, I made an emphasis on the fact that we want to produce something non-trivial. We don't want to take just old dualities and apply something to them and compute for non-dualities. We want to produce new things. So I'll get to that shortly, but I should have also emphasized that the goal of this lecture is, is also to make everything hands-on computable, so that you can actually go to Mathematica and get the answer for anything you want in a split second. So 
that's, that's also the level we're aiming at. So it's important to have, at least for me and many other topologists, to have something very computable, something that you can easily do for zillions of examples. Not one example, not two examples, hundred millions, hundred billions. That's, that's the goal. So that being said, table, table three. And again, I'll try to be as concrete and explicit as with other cases. So suppose you have, again, a vertex labeled by some integer a, to that you're going to assign q to the minus 3 plus a over 4 times our favorite integration variable x minus 1 over x squared. And if you have an edge that talks to two vertices with integration variables x1, x2, to that we're going to assign 1 over x1 minus its inverse. Uh, 1 over x2 minus its inverse. And then we're going to construct the same type of integral that depends now on additional new data, variable q, which made its appearance in here. So that's a new element. And that's going to be a principal value type of integral, again, on a unit circle. So absolute value of all xj is equal to 1, product over vertices. Uh, not quite. I, I haven't finished yet. That's, you're absolutely right. So that's, that's actually quite boring. Uh, but something else is going to appear in a second. <coughs> so here you have dot, 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 where you take each vertex factor and stick it in here. Then you do analogous thing for edges. So ij leaves in a set of edges. And you stick these type of factors in here. But then you do something else. You also put in a theta function associated to this bilinear form q. And theta function, if it's for q, has characteristics which are labeled precisely by the b's that we've seen in table 2. Okay, so more explicitly, this theta function for b and q is sum over lattice. with the offset, and then it's q to some quadratic power, minus n q inverse n over 4, all of that in the exponent, times x product over i, xi to the power bi. So just like in table 2, this guy is labeled by element, so this, this should be b, by element of our core kernel that we now know is, roughly speaking, element of H1 of M3. If you're going to generalize this to later story, what it's really labeled by is by equivalent way of writing the same set, is a set of connected components of the moduli space of a billion uh, flat connections, uh, GC flat connections on M3, that's going to be when we make generalizations. Yes. Right. So let's work with the same assumption that, uh, first of all, determinant is non-zero and Q is actually definite. So that was useful in table one and table three. So in particular, if you do this theta function and summation over indefinite, infinite lattice, it's better to have uh, definite Q. Yes, correct. Well, B is a label basically by a lattice divided by Q times the lattice. So in fact, when determinant of Q is non-zero, that's precisely the case where you have finitely many Bs. Meaningful. That's, that's, that's the definition of core kernel. Any other questions? Okay, so here I, yeah. No, see, co-kernel can be something small and tiny. For example, if determinant is one, uh, you have trivial co-kernel. 
Yes, yes. No, no, no. So this vector b takes values into z to number of vertices. So from the start, it takes. I have infinitely many choices. Yes, I'm saying that it starts life as something valued in a lattice. So it has it has huge number of choices. But then the choices which differ essentially by rows or columns of q are equivalent. So what I'm saying is that we should mod out. I mean, you can take any b you want. You can take any representative of your core kernel, lift it to this lattice. And it won't depend on the lift. That's all I'm saying. And it starts life as value, uh, something valued in a lattice, infinite dimensional set. And then, once you mod out by q times the lattice, then this is quotient which we identify as a core kernel. So actually, we had lots more choices for b than we need. It's this other point. So the map from the lattice to the core kernel is actually surjective. I can explain this later if, if, if. Correct. So this contributes overall factor, but this, uh, which I write as a theta function, by the way, you can write the whole thing in the usual way as product over vertices and, and, and edges. Uh, I just massage it in a more compact form. Uh, this actually is more meaningful. So it's that Q which comes in uh, and, and is more interesting. Okay, is this clear? Good. So then, then again, this is uh, table three. Just like table two, it's defined and depends on additional choice of data, namely this B, which from now on, I'm not going to use kernel. I'll try to shift to language which will be appropriate for very general case or any three manifold where you think of it as valued in set of a billion flat connections. It's labeled by that set. And the question is, what is this invariant? First of all, yes, very, very, very good question. Thank you very much. So, what kind of object is this? So, in fact, uh, yeah, let me switch to a computer. And show you what, what, what we get if we just compute it. So now, unlike the previous two cases, it actually depends on Q. So it depends on the original choice of three manifold, depends on this decoration data, but it's a power series in Q. The uh, question is, is it formal power series? Is it a function? Where does Q live? So first statement, uh, which is a theorem in a paper with Du, Kummer, and, and Pavel, is that it's uh, invariant under the Kirby moves. So it's actually a topological invariant, just like our other two tables. It makes sense to talk about it assigned to a three-manifold. So second statement is that you get a function which is convergent, is a Q series, which is convergent inside the unit disk. Has it a name, or does it appear before? The answer is no. As far as I know, this is a completely new three-manifold invariant, or rather collection of invariants, labeled by uh, connected components of abelian flat connections. And it's, it's a new kind of invariant which looks like a Q-series. Well, let's play with this a little bit and see, see what we get. It depends on topology of the three manifold, and then it depends on choice of this additional structure, of which you should think as uh, pretty much analog of the spin structure, spin C structure in the case of table two. So what I'm going to show you is just a mathematical code that implements this integration, and uh, the purpose is that we can try to um, do this uh, integration uh, in real time. So I want to show you that it works and check some of these moves. So this Mathematica code basically takes the input data of the graph with all these vertices and so on labeled as, as such. Here there are four vertices, some 
random declaration, and so on. So then, uh, let's see, the first two pages basically are definitions. So they, they verify that it's, uh, what are the eigenvalues, compute the matrix, it's inverse, but then the real calculation starts. So there are a couple of pages of that. And as you can see, it's pretty short. So here it's already the output. And um, this is a, a kind of answer what it looks like. So this is, this is an output, which up to overall power of Q, which doesn't appear to be integer, uh, gives you a Q series with integer powers, integer coefficients. Exactly. So another observation you make is that in this example, they all look like plus minus one. And this will be the case indeed for a large class of simple enough examples, but very soon, unfortunately, it will, it will break. But um, for all of these graphs with loops or not, you'll see integer coefficients. And again, so this kind of structure will be there. So another thing you discover is that um, what appears here is now like a modular form. In fact, it's a type of Q-series that you often see as character of some conformal field theory or modular form. And if you ask, have I even ever seen this kind of Q-series in textbook on modular forms? Not in a textbook, but in uh, lost notebooks of Ramanujan, you have seen this. This is, in fact, a mock modular object. So this is a perfect occasion to mention that, because if Ramanujan was in the audience, he would say, I wrote this first. And he actually is right. This is uh, some kind of... Uh, order seven, if I remember correctly, uh, mock modular thing. So first, let me uh, show you that it's invariant under Kirby moves. So I'm going to evaluate this notebook just to show you that it's done pretty quickly. Because, you know, when Steve Jobs was presenting his computer next, it wasn't really the actual next computer, but some other computer doing work in the box. So I want to be honest, and here it is. That's, that's the result. So what I'm going to take, I'll copy this part of the answer, save it here, and make some changes in the graph. So this is, say, 7. I'll replace it by 8, add another vertex, according to the rules that we discussed earlier today. So it's going to be next guy. Then I ask Mathematica to forget everything that happened before and reevaluate the notebook. and see what happens. So first, before we look at the answer, uh, I want to make sure that the input is correct. And indeed, the graph has changed. We have one additional vertex, and uh, labels are changed. But now, as I scroll down with a uh, moment of anticipation, uh, for those of you sitting closer, you can see that this Q-series is indeed identical to the other Q-series. So it actually works. It's, uh, it's something you can check quite, quite explicitly. So then you can go and pretty much do it for any three manifold you want. For instance, if you do E8 uh, linking diagram, no, no. That's actually a great question to which I don't know the answer. For which three manifolds do you get mock modular objects? Uh, it seems that that's definitely the case for all cyber three manifolds with a uh, small number of fibers, but then you start getting higher depth mock modular forms and more interesting objects which uh, would naturally be called quantum modular forms. So it has some interesting modularity in the game, but um, no, not always that. So let's see, uh, for E8, this is Poincaré sphere, I want to have four uh, plus four eight vertices, very good, uh, one, two, Three, so three goes to four, then three goes to five, five goes to six, six goes to seven, seven goes to eight. So let's again forget everything. You guys should double check if uh, my E8 thinking diagram is correct. Uh, sometimes I forget where to put the right edges and so on, so let's four, looks like four. Okay, let's give it a shot. So this is uh, a thinking diagram, which for topologist means Poincaré sphere. So that's, a, of course, very nice, famous three manifold and kind of the simplest of all, the beginning of the story. Um, 
So to me, it looks right. I don't think I made a mistake. So again, it's pretty simple. So you're going to see coefficients which are absolute value 1, but now that's a completely different Q series. Again, it has the same structure that up to overall power of Q outside uh, everything else is, is a nice Q series. So again, Romano John would recognize this as order 5 mock modular object. Uh, in his notebooks, this order has a meaning. Uh, to us, it means that it's attached to Romano John, and uh, that's very warm feeling. Uh, but the point is that now you can start playing with this and compute it for pretty much any um, uh, manifold. So here is a document of Breeze corn spheres. For topologies, these are very simple. This is a tiny sample of examples, and in fact, it's not all Breeze corn spheres, it's tiny. So as you can see, the document uh, had 200 pages. So in discussion section, if you want, you can name a random page in this document. Say, if you name page 57, it has hundreds of examples. I'll go to page 57, you pick a random graph, I run this program for you, and it spits out the answer. So my point is that it's extremely computable, it's extremely user-friendly, there is no question about it. So in addition, uh, this, is, this table here is just simple breeze corn spheres. As you can see, these are all graphs with one trivalent vertex, so they have the simplest uh, complexity, if you wish, but you can easily run it for any kind of graphs with 57 million vertices, which have valency uh, up to any number you wish. So uh, that's, that's uh, perhaps a good place to stop, um, and we'll continue with this uh, next time. So you presented arrows in one direction. Given a graph, you can construct a closed three-manifold. And given the, uh, this Mathematica notebook, you can output uh, certain invariants of that three-manifold. On the other hand, if I hand you a three-manifold, is there a way of constructing an arrow in the other way? Construct the corresponding graph and hence produce its uh, 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 three-manifold invariants. Yeah, so that's, um, again, I can only cover that much of uh, topology. So there are different constructions of three manifolds. I'll talk about them in second lecture. So one is uh, generalization of the method I presented to you here. So in fact, that generalization goes by the name surgery. And what we saw are particular kinds of surgeries, which if generalized can construct general three manifold. So there are many other constructions. Uh, based on Higer decomposition, triangulation, and so on. And um, I'll briefly say a few words about each one of them and how, um, how they fit and, and where we're going to go next. Uh, but see, when you tell me that you give me a three-manifold, how do you give it to me? Exactly. Yeah, so then uh, what I'm going to say in, in lecture two is a couple of words about these other constructions. And luckily, all of them have translation. For example, if you give me a Higer decomposition for Poincaré sphere, which is genus two, as Duke can explain to you in more detail, uh, there is a systematic way to go from that to, to, to this A8 plumbing graph. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry, question. So, um, just to verify, the class of manifolds that comes from these plumbing graphs, um, are, are any of them hyperbolic? Do they, do they intersect? Uh, not as far as I know, uh, at least for this one, but I didn't study it carefully enough, so I'm going to go to generalization. This is beginning of the construction, which is, goes by the name of surgery, and from surgery you can construct any hyperbolic manifold. So in yeah, fact, no, That's why I asked, because you... Yeah, yeah. So I'll show you examples of hyperbolic type in the second lecture. So this was self-contained universe of three manifolds, which is large enough uh, that it pretty much gets good approximation to generic one, because that will be a relatively easy step, and, uh, but not for four manifolds, so then I'll have to make a lot more work. So things labeled by graphs are good, in the, so that's what you should remember. There is S generalization, in fact, two layer. In the case of three manifolds, that gets you everything, but in the world of four manifolds, that's still very poor approximation. 
So it's a t small, relatively small corner. Even though I was emphasizing that it gets 50 million examples, then still it's, it's in the world of four manifolds, it's relatively small. And I'll say more about hyperbolic ones. And so so the, the other thing is, is probably something you will also talk about in the next lecture. But so, so while, while these invariants are new to mathematics, they, they are um, fully expected in, in physics, right? Um, well, they, they were expected so from our work with, uh, yeah. say, Schwartz and Buffa and so on. But the question is how to formulate them concretely and do the computations. So, oh. is it wrong to say that this is an analytically continued Trent Simons with some flat connection or some integration cycle that's not the standard one, that, that's labeled by a flat connection? I mean, that, that's that's way to say it, but that it conveys just, very it's little just information. Words, but it is something that exists that's well defined. Physically. Unless you tell me something how to define integration cycle, it's a statement. So, in any case, I'm, I think it's, it's not quite true. Unless you want to rewrite the history, uh, nobody has produced this statement and nobody said that such guys are labeled by billion connections. So, in fact, when uh, we were writing this paper with Pavel, it was a big surprise and nobody wanted to believe that, including myself. So that's, uh, that, that's, that's fairly new and surprising. But they, there should be corresponding invariants labeled by non-abelian connections as well. It's... That actually I don't know. So like I say, we'll, we'll see. So far nobody has constructed them unless in one limited class of examples of minus the volume type uh, flat connection. And I don't know if this will produce a Q-series with integer powers, integer coefficients. And to me, that's a very dear property because, like Piotr emphasized on his talk, integrality is, is a good property to aim for. So, I don't know. Unless I see really concrete examples which produce integer powers, integer coefficients for non-abelian connections, I'm going to say that's pie in the sky. And uh, if somebody else comes up and produces a very concrete way to compute it, I'll give full credit to that person who actually does that. So that's my attitude. I would have said that holomorphic blocks are precisely that for, for hyperbolic, not complements. Um, Again, I'll, I'll say more about uh, hyperbolic cases and triangulations in the second part. It will have its own slew of problems, unfortunately. But um, I, I, as far as I'll try to explain that, no, it has not been done. So, yeah. Uh, so, did you re reverse engineer the, uh, the the vertex and edge assignments from the Kirby calculus, or is it something that you got for free, like when you tried to look at some partition function or some theory? You mean uh, assignments of AIs, the, these integers, or um, yeah, uh, or, or the rules uh, how, I mean, how we associate uh, uh, the so the, the the rules of you know constructing the integral from a given uh, graph data? Yeah. Oh, this, this rules, so yeah, that's also the subject of what I'm going to explain in the second lecture, where these rules come from. So originally I said that this looks very contrived. You have, for example, signs and cinches, and that, that looks funny with square root of 8. Uh, it's not random. That, of course, had to be the case for this Kirby moves to be symmetries. But now the question is, where does it all come from? So what's, uh, what's the... Uh, it's hard to dream of, of this kind of rules, and that's not how we came about. Uh, it all comes from physics, and my goal is to explain that, that bit of physics. Yeah. Uh, so is it easy to see that the Kirby moves hold? I mean, is it something that is like kind of readily verifiable, or is it something extremely non-trivial that somehow things magically cancel and then you get... Once you have this integral type formulae or analogous formulae given by residues or whatnot, it's actually re easier enough to verify that you can make it easily mathematical theorem. So that's what we ver verify, for example, in work we do. But uh, there is also a physical principle that's much, much harder to verify. And um, I don't know, for example, how to do it in higher rank. So if you ask me a higher rank version of this, which relates to not SL2C, but rather SLNC kind of transignments and variants, then, um, or, or analogous Q series, I actually don't know how to uh, produce these rules because, not because uh, I would be guessing the integrals, but rather because my understanding of the physics is not as good as in this rank one case. 
had you chosen a particular value of B when you were displaying the mathematical notebook? So for simplicity, and, and uh, that's, that's actually the class of this, uh, what I call uh, breeze corn spheres, uh, that the simplicity of them is such that uh, they all have determinant Q equals 1. So though it looks like a huge list, there is... The other examples also in the mathematical file. Yeah, they, they, they're actually all from, from this kind of list. So uh, for simplicity, I chose examples which have where I don't have to bother you guys with bees. If I had more time, uh, I would show you a couple of highly non-trivial examples which actually go to the hyperbolic world, and they have several bees. So that in, the, in those cases, the modular property would mix them? In that case, modular property is uh, much, much more non-trivial than just uh, Romano, uh, Romano John's mock uh, modularity. Yeah. So it's... Yes, exactly. So, in, in some sense, the reason of simplifying the examples I showed you in Mathematica is that I don't have to say vector-valued. Otherwise, I would indeed have vector-valued type objects. Yeah, that's correct. Explanation for the modularity, like for example, I think Donaldson invariants are sometimes expressed. Yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll say that in part two. Okay. That, 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 that comes from physics, naturally comes from physics. Any other questions? Uh, well, this prefactor is analog of uh, what you've seen in Piotr's language uh, uh, or, or lectures as um, framing factor. So remember, there was analogous uh, minor thing uh, that, that, that he, he called framing. So that's pretty much uh, the origin of this factor. And it appears for a very similar reason. Okay, I don't see any hands, so let's thank Sergey again.